I don't hate Fred Phelps and Westboro Baptist Church the way most people do. One of the biggest reasons for this is because I actually have identification with them. I'm not a homophobic person, so that's not my identification. I'm not a fundamentalist, that's not my identification. I'm not a Christian, that's not my identification. Like them, I have a lot of venom in me, and I have manifested it in the ways they have. Right now, I'm doing very intensive soul searching. I want to improve myself and achieve my goals. Right now, I'm focusing, zooming in on Westboro Baptist Church because it represents a layer of my soul I am seeking to remove, the moral crusader level of my soul. This level of the soul is ineffective and it prevents me from getting what I want. I see myself in Fred Phelps and Westboro Baptist Church, thus I can't hate them. And I would like to read you a position paper from the autonomy party, the political party I have. And this represents my view since I am a member of the autonomy party, a founder in fact, and thus the changes I make in my personal life reflect the party. As you can see, I have some of the same themes as Fred Phelps does, and this was before I even cared two wits about Fred Phelps. I talk about how you're either 100% against abortion and alcohol or 100% for it, and those who are not doing anything about it are the opposite. Take a close look at what I write and see the comparisons, and this is why I need to change. I want to be an iconoclast a revered iconoclast and a moral crusader is not a revered iconoclast. This is from my book Abortion is Murder which extreme views against abortion I no longer agree with though I am certainly pro-life still. I don't find this particular way to argue a case to be effective. There's something wrong with it, and because it resembles the way Fred Phelps argues about things, it really shows me the problem. Part E, the awful Supreme Court. Now, this may remind you of how Phelps and his crew say all the courts are gay enablers. One of the most blameworthy groups is none other than those who presided on the Supreme Court in 1973. Others have certainly criticized the court ruling in these justices. I agree with this. The problem is others stop short. The problem is others stop at this point. Indeed, the 1973 Supreme Court justices are to blame, but they are by no means the only ones to blame. These supreme fools put this awful policy into practice. They gave birth to it. I only wish this birth would have been aborted. It would have been one of the rare justifiable abortions. We cannot forget all those who make it happen today. This book details all those who do. Sadly, all those who make it happen are left out of the picture pretty much whenever anyone else makes a half-loaded pro-life argument. It takes a village to raise a child. It also takes a village to raise abortion clinics. Although giving birth is a powerful influence, others still have an impact. The Supreme Court justices of 1973 gave birth to this evil, but so many others in society continue to nourish its growth. Those who give birth to parasites are probably among the most blameworthy, but those who fertilize the growth of par parasites are also culpable in their own right. The problem with justices these days is that they are not conservative enough. If our current justices were conservative at all, abortion would have been outlawed long ago. Scalia is an arch-liberal. If he was conservative, abortion would have been illegal again. Not only is the ideal, ideological nature of our liberal Supreme Court a problem, once again the Supreme Court has a major problem with priorities. The Supreme Court, just like everyone else, it seems views stopping abortion as an extremely low priority. Irrelevant tort cases and other nonsense are deemed more important. It usually takes a long time for most cases to be heard by the Supreme Court. Many cases must sit away before the Supreme Court will review them. 
Hair becomes gray and teeth fall out before many important cases that deal with pressing constitutional issues are heard. But one case involving a dispute between two ultra-liberal losers, Gore v. Bush, is pushed to the front of the pile, while pressing concerns of social justice are forced to wait years before they are finally heard. The Supreme Court should have let the ultra-liberal losers wait and have tried more pressing cases, especially those that could overturn Roe v. Wade. The unborn are rarely considered in the dealings of the Supreme Court. It is disgraceful. Has the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court ever taken a pro-life oath? Has the Supreme Has the Chief Justice ever required Associate Justices to take pro-life oaths? No. Such a fact proves how liberal and pro-choice the current Supreme Court is. I do believe that all Justices of the Supreme Court should be required to take pro-life oaths. If a justice refused to take a pro-life oath, can we really trust him or her? Do you want someone who foams at the mouth and drips blood from her or his hands to be on the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court sets the standards for other courts. The Supreme Court should thus require pro-life oaths. Hopefully, if the Supreme Court does this, then the inferior courts would follow. Imagine how wonderful the ripple effect could be.